esteemed mayor, uh, esteemed members of the academy, friends, uh, I would like to thank you all for your welcome. And uh, I would like to acknowledge, uh, as, as well as previous speakers, that we do stand on Aboriginal land. And I would also like to acknowledge that you've all been through an extraordinary traumatic experience the last few months, which we all watched with, you know, our breaths kind of held what you guys went through. And I would like to say that it's a real kind of trauma for all of us and that we are kind of standing behind you in all of this kind of really difficult um, loss that you have had. And uh, also to acknowledge uh, Ferdinand as the ground zero for, for heat, and that's another extraordinary thing. So thanks for inviting me. I have a lot to learn. And I will try to say a few things about Athens, um, which actually has several uh, similarities. Um, we are a region with um, 64 municipalities. Um, about um, uh, the, the, the city of Athens has about 700,000 residents, but it's used by two or three million people daily because it's the center of the city and all the major things are there, administrative, etc. This is more or less what it looks like. It's at the center of this um, area, which is relatively near the sea, but it's landlocked as a municipality. Um, it has an extraordinary density. It's uh, uh, 17,000 people almost per square kilometer, which uh, uh, Paris is about 20,000, which is the highest density city in Europe. Uh, and then a couple of cities in Spain are right after Athens. Um, as you can see, most of the buildings were suddenly built between the 1950s and the 1980s. There was an explosion of the city, so it's very anarchically built. And uh, about 70%, uh, actually now it's even more, it's closer to 80% of the, of the city is non-water permeable surfaces, which of course creates um, uh, problems with the urban heat island. As far as the green data is, we have a rather small percentage of green area, less than seven square meters per inhabitant. Uh, we have 130,000 trees, 94 of them are in street lines, and um, a, a real majority in mulberries, and I'll tell you why this is important. And it's a very uneven distribution. Here you can see a mapping that we did in Athens, which as previous people mentioned, you can clearly see where the dark, um, the dark blue areas, which is the really low income, poverty line income households are, uh, which is the west and north side is the part which has less green and it's the side which has the most uh, uh, high temperatures as well. And this is true, like you can read the city as soon as you can see where the green is and where there is no green, you can like bet that that's where the, the, the more vulnerable economically and socially populations actually live all over. So um, in 2019, there was um, a study that came out that, that said that Athens is one of the most kind of uh, uh, cities that will face the greater impact in Europe from heat waves out of 571 cities. And Moody's also in the uh, December of 2018 basically said that if we don't do anything about our heat, like uh, heat adaptation, we're going to face serious kind of credit issues. So um, what's going on right now in Athens is that we have about 15 to 25 days above 36 degrees Celsius, uh, which is um, uh, projected to rise to well over 25 days by uh, 2050. These are the projections, average 2%, uh, 2 uh, uh, degrees Celsius um, rise of temperatures. I mean, you can see it, we have an urban um, heat island, uh, which is very, very strong. We have the difference during the, um, the night can be five degrees between the center of Athens and the, and the uh, first kind of suburbs, uh, which goes up to 10 degrees during the day, can go up to 10 degrees during the day. We have about 200 deaths per year that are related to high temperatures. Electricity increases. We have a, a high level of energy poverty, like 25% of people uh, suffer and they're not able to use um, the, 
we also went through an economic crisis and a recession and all that. You guys probably heard about that. So, uh, <laughs> so um, uh, what is kind of interesting that nobody, the, the commercial activity declines, which we've seen this is a tendency also in cities in general. But what's interesting, which people don't often think in cities, is insects and insect related illnesses. Because uh, apart from the fact that we had like these different uh, illnesses like um, the West Nile virus and dengue fever and stuff like that, which we didn't have before, because of mosquitoes that are much more now because of the high temperatures and the fact that in the winter we don't have really cold kind of temper and, and different kind of mosquitoes have also um, uh, moved to our country. Uh, but also there's a particular bug that we discovered this summer uh, that has affected our mulberry trees, which are 25% of our street trees and already uh, uh, 1,300 trees have been affected. I put an extra zero there. and. Um, and 350 have already died. So this could be a real uh, change. It could be a real change in the city if we start kind of really losing mulberries in a really large. Uh, so this is an interest, another interesting kind of issue of heat. So then uh, we started in 2016, I think together with uh, Sydney to our uh, to the, resili the, pr the process of uh, creating a resilient strategy and we went to the people, which is what we did. And of course, the people did acknowledge that there is an issue with climate change. The people actually were more ready to acknowledge it than the political kind of uh, uh, establishment. We created the resilient strategy. This is a map. It has four pillars, the green city, a proactive city, a vibrant city, and an open city with different actions. Um, in the green city, we have a whole climate adaptation action plan, which is basically a heat mitigation plan, uh, which has um, about 29 actions. And then uh, we have a climate mitigation, uh, climate mitigation plan and an energy mitigation roadmap. And um, I will speak about the heat mitigation here. I just wanted to give you kind of like the, where it all belongs. These are the four basic pillars in what we're trying to, to achieve, which is to enhance the city's green and blue infrastructure, to improve the built environment, mitigate heat, to protect public health in the most vulnerable cities, and to raise public awareness through this campaign that we call Cool Athens. And these are specific kind of targets that we agreed with, uh, with the people of the municipality and the, and the people from the, uh, the city in, in kind of working together that were feasible and that we would really try to, 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 to put them as specific goals for 2030. Like, for example, that every time that we re regenerate a public space, it will have at least 20% more green, that there will be, uh, that we will try to connect green areas to create green corridors so that we have more air movement, that we would have 50 reduction of drinking water for irrigation. And um, so now I'm going to tell you about the actions that we started um, implementing. First, I'll talk about the blue and green infrastructure. And I will start by a loan that we managed to get because of the strategy of the resilient strategy. It was a bigger loan, but we managed to get a specific loan from the European Investment Bank called NCFF. And we were the first country that did so. It's called Natural Capital Finance Facility, which is only for nature-based solutions and blue and green infrastructure. And, um, and I'm, I'm putting this project first because it's 5 million and 500,000 extra for studies. And the interest is very, very low. But I'm putting it there because it is indeed very difficult to finance blue and green infrastructure. So, you know, this is like an example of something that was difficult to achieve. And I think it was, it's an important kind of um, issue to point out. It's, it's, it's five major, four major projects in Athens that we have kind of uh, um, identified and there is money, the 500,000 is to create studies for them that then will go into implementation with the 5 uh, million. The, uh, another very important project is Likabetus Hill, which is a hill in the center of Athens, right across from the Acropolis that people really love. We went into a very extensive uh, community engagement and high level and low level and like uh, about a year and a half we worked on this uh, with the two major universities and the Rebuild by Design, uh, a kind of a team that came from, from the US and another university and a, like about one 
1,800 people were involved to create a vision and specific actions for the future of the hill. And the first things that we actually are implementing is, um, again, nature kind of based things. One of them is for land erosion, because we had these flash floods which totally eroded after long periods of drought, the, the hills, so depleting the soil and the, and the green um, res uh, capital of the hill. And uh, so we kind of did anti-erosion um, uh, work. And, and we took out all the asphalt and created like a, 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 it's about three kilometers of asphalt that went up and down the hill. We kind of took it out and put uh, nature-based kind of materials for it. And, um, and uh, we have like a whole plan of kind of slowly taking cars off of the hill and giving priority to um, uh, th biodiversity mostly in, on the hill. This was a project that I think, uh, talking to Beck, you have created an even better version of it here in Sydney, which is to create uh, all possible multiple ways of cooling a neighborhood and testing them out and seeing from cool roofs and cool um, asphalt, like cool covers for asphalt, like cool asphalt, uh, to uh, pocket parks, taking cars away, shading materials, uh, green walls, like all of them, and having them at different combinations to see what works and what doesn't work by having like a three-year plan of, of uh, measuring it. We're still st at the very beginning just testing different products. So we ha we're like really at the beginning of it. Uh, another issue which actually was something that we, we um, uh, Paris has really focused on this as a resilience action. They call it school yard oasis, they've, they've uh, identified, because Paris is also very densely built, like Athens, that there are the spaces of schoolyards can be the spaces that can create microclimate, like tiny parks for the city. So if you have 700 schools, you can actually create like a, a, an acupuncture for the city, which can create different... And a urban forest uh, mapping, which is which we don't have, and we have started kind of creating, um, which can allow us to assess and maintain properly our uh, urban forests, and um, and try to find what kind of species where, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and then the, uh, the the I'm moving very quickly to the blue infrastructure, which is that we created a really important partnership with the main water and sewage company, which is half public, half private. And uh, we started putting public uh, fountains in, in Athens. Um, the other thing is that we started kind of monitoring the resor water resources and uh, the type of um, uh, usage in the municipality to, to create a blue footprint, to create more um, sustainable management of water in the municipality. We discovered that we have like this amazing aqueduct from 100 AD that uh, actually takes water out of the aquifer and th we throw it into the garbage, into the sewage, and we are starting to tap into it to irrigate and to... Uh, so it's a, like an important resource that is a backup resource for us to cut using drinkable water, to stop using drinkable water. Um, we have created a, a, a mobile unit that takes, that you can put it anywhere in green space, that takes um, sewer, like brown water, and turns it into uh, water for irrigation. And uh, finally, the last thing is like, it has to do with what we have done for public uh, health. Uh, we created an application which is called Extrema. Um, it, it's an application that you can put in uh, your data, which is basically where you are, if you're male or female, your age and whether you have chronic illness or uh, medical or your daily medical treatment. And depending on the relative humidity and air temperature, it gives you a personalized risk. Um, this is based on data that we get from satellites and it, uh, in collaboration with the National Observatory of Athens and the um, university um, Medical, the medical school who gave us, who created basically this kind of mapping we, of risk assessment for Athens, we have created this. And Paris got really excited and Paris copied it and made it better. And, and then Rotterdam also adopted it and there is like Extrema Rotterdam and then uh, Milano is now doing it. And uh, so now they're thinking of creating one for Europe 
Um, so anywhere you can go, uh, you can actually access this information. And the good thing is that it's not just for you. You can put your grandmother or your whatever, and it tells you if they're in risk. And there's a map to, show, to tell you where they should go to take protection, where there is air conditioning or where there is like the closest kind of lowest temperatures that you can go to to take cover. Um, and this, this was part of a cool Athens thing, which like you guys, we created a fan that uh, was this shape and that was in Greek and in English of what to do. And we keep giving it out every year. And we also did these NFC tags that uh, you can put your phone and you don't have to download the app, but it gives you all the information about heat and, and risk. And also we, cr we put it in these areas where we have a lot of refugees and immigrants living in apartments, in camps, and in places where they go, because that's also a very kind of vulnerable community. And thank you very much. That's it.